Thanks. Okay, everyone, thanks and welcome to another session of System Thinking Ontario. Uh, we're actually doing a uh, extended session in geography today uh, with Doug Ostrom and Carolyn Ardowich, who are, uh, now Doug I know is actually Canadian. Carolyn, you're also Canadian, right? Yep, born in Montreal. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we'll bring you back home for this session. Thank um, you. So, <laughs> So today's session is going to be on humanistic principles and social systems design, and we'll find out what that all is. Um, we're going to go around in our usual circle and have people introduce themselves just briefly. Uh, the question for today, we'll make a variation, is um, so if you could introduce yourself and let us know uh, when it is, or if, if you actually heard of socio-technical systems theory uh, before. Uh, so I'll start off, I'm David Ng. And the first time I did socio-technical systems theory was in my fourth year Bachelor of Commerce class at University of Toronto with Mark Nevins. Um, so I've um, been doing that for a long time. Uh, Kelly, say hello. You're oh, on mute, you. Kelly. Kelly, you're on mute. Kelly, yeah, there she is. Hi, my name is Kelly Okamura. I'm from, um, I'm Toronto based. And no, I don't have a clue what you're, what you're speaking about in terms of uh, this time of type of systems. I'm still uh, floundering on systems as far as like which one works for, for this or that, but I'm um, appreciating the learning journey. Thanks Kelly. Uh, Christina. Hi, everyone. Um, I am a beginner with systems thinking, but um, the person who introduced me to it is actually, actually Peter Jones, who's on the call, who was my professor in the SFI program. Um, I, I graduated five years ago. And uh, I was, as I was telling Kelly, when I came on the call, I'm just very excited to kind of jump back into it and expand my uh, knowledge in this space. Welcome back to the community then. Um, Zad, say hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Zad Khan. Uh, I'm also a graduate of the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. So I came to systems thinking through uh, the program and the course that Peter Jones instructed. Um, I can't remember if Peter mentioned socio-technical systems in the course because it was a morning uh, session. So it was, hard to, it was hard to tune in at that hour. <laughs> but I know that uh, David has uh, turned me on to it through the Eric Trist uh, and Emery uh, work uh, and the focus on socio-technical systems there. So yeah, I'm glad to learn more about it. Thanks. Thanks, Zad. Anthony Upward, actually a co-founder of System Thinking Ontario we have not seen forever. Hello, Indeed. Anthony. Hello, hello. It's very nice to be back. And you're right, it has been forever. Um, uh, so I came across uh, Eric Trist and Fred Emery's work uh, when I was doing my master's at, up at York University, where I believe, and I'm going to get this wrong, it was Fred M. No, it was Eric Trist who was up at uh, York in the Faculty of Environmental Studies for a while in the early late 70s, early 80s, yeah. and came across his work on the quality of working life that he did with the Ministry of Ontario in the Ministry of uh, Labour in Ontario, um, and since then have been learning more and more about it um, up until realizing that appreciative inquiry is sort of a follow-on from socio-technical systems thinking, sort of. <laughs> I, I see Doug going back and forth, we'll have discussion on that. So we'll have interactive sessions and people can uh, put their comments in the queue uh, in the chat. So I, I see that Anthony may be early on that. Uh, Peter, say hello. Hi, it's good to join uh, tonight. I'm Peter Jones, professor at OCAD University's Strategic Forest and Innovation Program and um, I think we teach socio-technical systems more in the design for health um, um, course in systemic design. So the, the course is, is taught in, in both these master's programs, but socio-technical systems applies very, you know, very specifically in healthcare services and, and uh, you know, clinical practices and in and in um, processes in hospitals and in healthcare systems. So it, uh, so it occupies a pretty specific place in my book, Design for Care, and we teach from that in Design for Health program. So people should be familiar with it in that program. 
in the strategic foresight program, it's not as uh, um, we don't cover it as much, um, partly because of the focus of the program is more oriented towards uh, innovation and uh, social change contexts. So, I mean, I think we only touch on it, and it's a, it's an, it's an, it's an important context that that is probably a, you know, a deeper next stage of learning for for a lot of uh, those who've been through the course. So. So who should be next? Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, Seymour, say hi. Hi, it's good to be back. I keep trying to make these sessions and can't make it. I'm in Toronto. I'm a, actually a doctoral student at uh, Fielding Graduate University, and I'm studying systems in larger context. I first uh, read Eric Trist's stuff about 35 or so years ago. And that was my beginning introductions as, as I was doing a lot of consulting and research work on re-engineering and rethinking organizations. So have been following uh, that area uh, for at least that many years and uh, still am a neophyte. So looking to learn more. Thanks. Uh, Sama? Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Samah Kamamaz. Uh, I'm a current student at the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program at OCAT. And I just recently finished the systemic design course. So I'm still reading, rereading the content from the course. So I don't really know a lot about, about um, socio-technical systems, but I think it might be, um, I'm excited to learn about it as it might be relevant to my major research project. Thanks. Josh, say hi. Hi everyone. I am uh, in Toronto and have been attending um, these uh, talks for a couple of years uh, uh, when I can make it. Um, I don't know socio-technical systems, but um, you folks have uh, talked about Eric Trist um, almost every time I've shown up. So uh, <laughs> looking forward to this. Thanks. Thanks. Medina? Hi, everyone. My name is Medina. I am um, I'm also an SFI student uh, and just recently finished Peter's class on systems. Uh, so uh, very much a newbie, but looking forward to learning more. And um, I know nothing about socio-technical systems, but hopefully by the end of this, on end of this, I'll learn a lot more, so. Thanks. Elena. Hi, I'm Elena Leonard, at this point, a freelance researcher. And I ran into Carolyn when Barry Clemson, Ernie Lowe, and I did a collaborative workshop with them uh, down in, I guess it was North Carolina, a couple of decades ago, and had the opportunity to use some of the knowledge uh, after that, and also to meet Enid Mumford in the first uh, disintegration in Manchester Business School. Cool. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Elena. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, a very long time. Well, nice to see you. Yes, like, well, I can't see you, but nice to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Emily. Hello. Um, hi. I'm a systems thinking newbie, and I'm based in Toronto as well. And like a few others um, who've introduced themselves, I am a current student at Strategic Foresight and Innovation. And I heard about this group through Peter Jones, um, through his class at OCAD. And I am currently rereading Thinking in Systems by Donella Meadows and really enjoying it. Um, I don't know anything about socio-technical systems, and, but I am keen, keen to learn. Um, nice to meet you, everybody. Good. Thanks. Uh, Rob. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rob Tilly. I'm a design researcher and strategist. Um, also studied under Peter Jones uh, a number of years ago uh, in the early stages of the SFI program. And um, on a professional level, I don't spend uh, much time with the specific tools of systems thinking and 
in its various uh, categories, but uh, I've recently encountered some situations where uh, I would like to reintroduce the tool set as I can. So looking forward to re-engaging and, and hearing about the tonight's topic. Thanks. Elisa? Hi, everybody. Um, I am also an SFI student, like many of my classmates on this call, and uh, I have just finished uh, Peter's uh, course, and I thought uh, joining this call would be um, an opportunity to get even more information about it. I was pretty excited about the, the class and looking forward to learning some more. But I also, like, like everybody else said, I don't know a lot about socio-technical systems or much more than uh, Peter imparted <laughs> over the last four months. So uh, happy to, to learn and, and also excited to meet all of you. Thanks. Carrie? Hi everyone. Also kind of like a broken record. I'm also an SFI student along with the others. Um, also finished up uh, Peter Jones course and happy to, uh, to learn more about the topic today. Thanks. Susan? Hi everyone. Um, I run my own consultancy business after 25 years in the nuclear industry. And my focus uh, is on high reliability industries, looking at uh, aspects of governance and organizational culture primarily. So I'm, I'm looking forward to deepening my learning. Great, thanks. And Susan. Well, Susan's still on mute. That was just Susan, I believe. Ah, sorry. That was that one, like Carrie and then Susan. Okay, I've been through the whole list. I'm sorry, Dan. Okay, so I know what STS isn't. All right, so we, I always thought that STS was the name of a Cadillac, short name for Cadillac STS. So after I've done that work with David on the system changes learning circle stuff, I realized <laughs> it wasn't that. It was actually social technical systems. Uh, so I've been with the uh, system changing learning circles since its exception about three years ago, and we're on a 10 year cycle. So kind of looking forward to it because I believe that's where the magic's gonna happen and the system changes stuff in the, the STS area. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, I'm more or less gonna let Doug and Carolyn run the session. Um, I'll, I'll give them the challenge I always give, which uh, maybe it's good if Doug introduces Carolyn and Carolyn introduces Doug. Um, but um, the, the notes we'll have going through is I'll be monitoring the chat and so people can put in questions and I'll uh, try to moderate them the best I can. So uh, Doug and Carolyn, um, up, up to you. I'm just trying to think of, of uh, what I know of, of Carolyn's original history when she was first introduced to STS. It was with um, Bill Wesley at the McGill Center for uh, was it quality of working life there? Or was it socio-technical systems? No, quality of working life. Right, right. Quality of working life was, was the original framing of STS um, in Canada. Uh, Labor Canada had a quality of working life center that was funded. Ontario had a quality of working life center. McGill did. Anyhow, Carolyn, um, I, I guess was, uh, you're gonna have to fill, fill in the, the, uh, the <laughs> blanks, Carolyn, because a sociology student at McGill with Bill Wesley, as an undergrad in a graduate program was introduced and then became part of the practitioners that actually use socio-technical systems, principles and practices. And, and one of the longest running socio-technically system designed plants, probably in the world, is just south of Montreal in Bromont. And it's a GE aviation plant. And Carolyn was one of the principal designers of that. And um, the whole notion of, of deliberations well before Pava wrote his work in the 1980s was something that they implicitly built into that design. She then went on to work for the last 
35, almost 40 years, we're dating ourselves around the globe using as a foundation for her work, socio-technical systems, thinking, principles and practices. So that's my understanding of Carolyn's introduction and exposure to STS. Yes, the only thing I'll add is I did two more Greenfield sites of the Sociotech for Pratt and Whitney and Bell Helicopter because uh, the Canadian government was very interested in these kinds of designs in the aviation industry. And so they were funding actually this kind of design back in the early 80s. But thank you, Doug, that was very good. Now I don't think I can do as well with you is that, but people have already mentioned and you should tell us a bit about your, you had direct contact with Eric Trist while you were at York University. Right. And um, you've also been a consultant as long as I have for almost 40 years. Uh, you also still continue to teach. And um, your work probably was more about these uh, socio-ecological systems and alliances and that kind of thing, right. more than the kind of uh, plant and, and organizational work that I did. So do you want to fill in some of that, please? Yeah, I, I think it's, it, it, uh, it, it speaks to how functionally siloed uh, academic institutions are, at least traditional ones. So I had just wrapped up in 1981 my dissertation defense, and I'd been es essentially studying quality of life. And then there was a conference in Baltimore, quality of working life, um, which is all part of like ecology of working life. There was a series of conferences that a, a colleague of ours um, uh, kind of organized and convened. And, and so I, I leave Toronto and I fly to Baltimore, go to this conference and find out that the grandfather of the field of quality of working life and socio-technical systems, Eric Trist, was located maybe 100 meters away from where my office was in psychology at York University. And it was too late in the semester to sign up for his courses. I was doing a postdoc to be retooled so I could teach at business schools and things. Uh, but when I got back to York, I, I made a beeline to meet with him and had the pleasure of being connected with him and the York Quality of Working Life Center for the remaining two or three years that he was at York. And I don't think this is a claim to fame because I had no idea what I was talking about and probably uh, still don't. But he started taking sabbaticals or, or, or staying away from York in the wintertime and going to, uh, I think, Victoria at the time. And so they needed somebody to teach the socio-technical systems course in that spring semester. And while I was teaching at Brock full time, I would commute into Toronto and, and teach the STS course without any idea what I was talking about, frankly. But um, it still worked out and, and it was a, and that was actually, interestingly enough, not in the School of Business at York, but in the Faculty of Environmental Studies. And I think somebody mentioned having been a alumni of that program. So that's my background. And Carolyn's right. I, I look more at, at domain level uh, socio-tech, socio-ecological. So shall I bring up the slides, Carolyn, and you yes. can start us? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you to everybody for inviting us to speak to you tonight. Uh, we're very pleased to be sharing um, this fundamental theory that was created by the Tavistock Institute located in um, the UK um, these, by these scientists 70 years ago. But it's um, mostly known, and we got trapped by, I think, the label socio-technical systems theory. So the STS Roundtable in North America has been in existence for 35 years now. But in the last, oh, Doug, I must know you for what, 15 years now? 
Um, the last 15, there's been a lot of um, reflection on whether we are really still relevant and, and, you know, are we or aren't we and what makes us relevant to what's going on in the world today. We also met people, we have colleagues in uh, Australia, um, in Scandinavia, in uh, Europe, in Belgium, in the Netherlands. We were bumping into them and they're doing STS and saying the same thing. And so um, Doug and myself and this uh, other Canadian who actually lives in BC, <laughs> but we've known Bert also for uh, quite a few years. We decided to uh, really dig deeper into um, what is it that we were, did, that we actually inherited from Tristan Emery uh, and try to write that up and try to understand it for the new generation of people that are coming in to the round table, but also for people who have been practicing it for a long time to really understand what is the value of what we have. And uh, we think we have a deeper level of understanding about social systems that informs design. And uh, this conceptual renewal to discover this, as I say, started in North America um, a couple of years ago, but over the past two years, we've been really seriously writing and discussing and presenting the concepts we're gonna share with you tonight. Uh, and you'll see, Doug will show you the slides of sort of the original theory and talk a bit about how we try to apply it to today's uh, organizational context and how it we think needs to be changed to deal with a more dynamic environment. And these concepts we've, sh as I said, shared and shaped with co these colleagues from uh, around the world and created a global network for smart organization design that uh, we continually about every three years get together in Europe. This year it's going to be hopefully, it was canceled uh, last fall, but this fall they're hoping to hold it in Norway. And other times we hold it in sometimes in Toronto, Vancouver, and of course in the US as well. And we feel the explanatory power that uh, of this coherent fundamental theory helps make the design knowable to all participants in the ecosystem so they can all participate fully. That's very important to us, that this not be expert driven design. We uh, think that once people have fully understood and deeply integrated the interplay of the dynamics in these different systems that they live in, they'll no longer be at the women will of these external forces and can instead channel them to create a lasting impact in their own lives and in our world. So what we are wanting to share is our new understanding of STS, but we will also call it, cover what um, <clears throat> has been the traditional understanding of it. Next slide, uh, Doug. I might go into slideshow mode because I know you have some builds coming. Yeah, I, 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 what I have found sometimes is that, you know, that's true. I do. No, I don't want to do the build. It, okay. It, <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> we think we are, uh, humanity is at a fork in the road again. <laughs> We've answered this call many times in our human evolution. And we also think we're pretty far along the technocratic pathway but it's not too late to change course. And so what we're trying to do with our reading and writing and speaking now, and we're hitting the age of past retirement, so we don't know how much longer we'll do this, but we have a lot of energy for uh, bringing this to um, people's attention to see if they could use it to create a more humane world. And, um, also, we realize now this year, the pandemic has revealed the basic flaws in our current social ordering and raised everyone's awareness so that we have more informed and capable leaders and designers that are both ordinary citizens and professionals. A fundamental tenet of organizational theory is that an effective organization design will align with and reflect the key characteristics of its operating environment. 
So because we live in a world of exponential change, we feel the appropriate organizational response is a design that is dynamic, fluid, and complex. And the more diffuse and fluid the nature of the design is, the harder it is to govern. So that's why we need collaborative design and self-organizing and the relational aspects of so the socio-psychological lens and socio-ecological perspective that are so important to support the work systems for value creation. So we think we have a lot of choices still in the culture we create, the scenarios we imagine, the stories we tell, uh, the decisions we make about which technologies to fund or buy, which project products to make, whether we use automation or don't, that will determine our future. And we think these uh, topics need careful deliberation using the three perspectives to guide us with deliberation design to make sure the culture we create in the process of design includes all the voices. So uh, we feel very strongly about the uh, principles of collaboration and Doug will talk about that now. But first we want to go to the next slide, Doug. Sure. Say that uh, at least in our community, we don't have very many of these social system designers in our community. Um, you can see they all come from a community that we know very little about. And um, they some, sometimes uh, are still making design choices based on the implicit logics of control and uniformity. Uh, I did some work with Red Hat two, about two years ago, and I could see some of the language and thinking was changing uh, and becoming much more uh, collaborative and much more uh, humanistic. But um, there's still a lot of times I could see that we were straddling two different kinds of logic. And so um, our community has been trying to see if we can bring some of these social system designers who are making these choices in the way they design software and AI and machine learning to really work together with them in new ways to um, design for the future. Okay, I'll turn it over to you in our first principles, Doug. Yeah, and 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 this is this is still a fundamentally a uh, a work in initial progress. Um, for 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 many years, the there was some soul searching around the socio technical systems roundtable, and it was really about so why are we doing this? Well, uh, a lot of it was was sort of colleagueship and getting together with people who we kept saying have the same shared values. And we kind of went, well, I wonder what those are. And we even did a poll, a survey on it and still didn't come to any, any sort of absolute clear uh, consensus. And, and what, you know, uh, Fred, uh, Fred Emery and, and Eric Trist, or Emery in particular, had talked about, about ideals, right? Um, and, and he's created his own list of those. Um, these certainly overlap with that. But this notion of first principles, you know, that from which, you know, that the first basis from which, which something is known, um, Elon Musk has popularized this notion, boiling a problem down to its most fundamental truths. And we started saying, wait a minute, what is at the essence of what was historically socio-technical systems, but really applies to how, how do we have, how do we create more humane enterprises? And, and as we started looking at it, and as I said, this is just a work in progress and your input, your feedback, your thoughts, your critique will be absolutely uh, invaluable to us. We came up with some of these, right? And, and this, is, this has been an iterative process as we've shared it with the uh, STS roundtable community. 
The first is still open systems and the notion of whole systems thinking and, and, and also of, of wholeness, right? And within that, and, and I'll speak briefly to the socio-psychological, socio-technical and socio-ecological perspectives, um, which reflect the, the, the reach of the Tavistock Institute, not just the socio-technical. And then seeing enterprises as organizers and organisms within the natural order. And, and so it's, it's sort of looking at, at social systems as really part of our living systems, right? And with that then, the, one of the, you know, sort of the, the notions of, of humanism is, is this profound respect for people. And in practice, it's enhancing human dignity, dignity and it's, it's really trusting and believing in people. And some of McGregor's work on this would, would be essentially theory why assumptions about people. Uh, and another that's critical is, 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 a, is, this, is this kind of adherence to the notion that capital and technologies are tools that need to be in service of all people, not people in service of capital and technology, which seems to be kind of a means and inversion that um, is fairly prevalent in society. And, and then tied to that would be truly human-centered design of technology. And, and just as a footnote, even, even amongst Carolyn, Bert Painter and I, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bert Painter, he stayed in Canada and lives on Bowen Island uh, near Vancouver. Uh, he sees that as a first principle, the, the importance of really looking at digital technology and how dramatically it, it has the potential to either digital tailorism and further kind of control people, or it has the, the potential also to really liberate people. Um, and, and these next three may in fact be subsets of the first, uh, first principle respect for people, but self-determination so that people have agency and a certain degree of, of independence, not traditional dependence, that they have voice and, and can participate in designing the work that they do in the communities that they're a part of. And, and with that comes choice. And that's also choice around how tools are used. Uh, and, and yet it's not strictly autonomy. It really has to be tempered as responsible autonomy because we then, we, we, we live within communities, communities of work, communities of, 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 of life, families. And so it's, it's this paradox of self-determination coupled with co-determination and a recognition of the interconnectedness that, that is even more salient and, and in our face, like what we're dealing with here. Uh, and, and with that is, is then the recognition of our interdependence, not just our interconnectedness. And so connection is, is really, is, is critical to us as a social species. And communion is, is, is a big part of that too. And I'm not using communion in, in sort of the ecumenical sense, but rather as a, as a description of us as a social species. One of the things that, that um, one of the other major influences in my life was a professor at York in psychology, David Backen, who was at one point the, the president of the humanistic psychology division with the American Psychological Association. And over his very, very lengthy uh, and esteemed career, uh, debated with B.F. Skinner around behaviorism and some of those notions, right? Behaviorism versus humanism. And I do not think that Trist, who was also at his core a humanist, and Bakken, who was clearly a humanist, ever crossed paths, which I think was just is just you know two two intellectual giants at the same university, who who've never who and and and, and with overlapping uh, interests in 
how how the world should operate never never connected it would have been absolutely amazing to have had the two of them together just in conversation anyhow uh, deliberations becomes an important part of this uh, negotiated order and consensus dialogue and dialogic design um, Carol and I are very pleased that that Peter is is here this evening um, Peter Carol and just shared with Bert Paint and I Peter and I about a month ago uh, your work and and had you know just come across that as well so um, there's there's all of these pockets of people doing really similar work that that aren't as connected uh, as as they should be and, and I've observed that for 30 plus 40 years being associated even on the periphery with academia and then lastly one of the things that seems to be part of sort of natural communities is is this notion of mutualism and reciprocity and symbiotic relationships rather than parasitic relationships and 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 then the design needs to be designing needs to be such that it, it generates mutual advantage and mutual benefits so that's that's what we've identified as as a starting list of first principles and and the open systems of the wholeness piece also then reinforces this notion that many of the practitioners in socio-technical systems didn't fully reflect or incorporate a lot of the wisdom that the Tavistock Institute had developed and only were using one leg of a three-legged stool. And the socio-technical systems of, or the STS systems perspective was primarily focused on workplaces and organizing for value creation um, and processes. And this is important that jointly optimize both the socio and technical features in an integrated work system. Now, yeah, there's another way of looking at that is, is trying to find the optimal fit between people in organizations and work systems and the technology that uh, is being used, as well as the technical, which is the work processes, right? And the management processes and, and all of these sorts of things. So the key design parameters in, include value creation, work system, and, and as it says, they're just optimizing the fit of this, this technical and social features of a work or, or an organization. The reality of our organizations, though, is around the socio-psychological perspectives. And it's, and it's what individuals need for agency to thrive as a group and to, to, to be able to experience responsible autonomy and, and a chance for voice and, and, and uh, uh, some of the other things that, that uh, Daniel Pink describes of what really motivates us at work, challenge and mastery, sense of purpose. But it really has to look at some of the key group dynamics, the power relationships, uh, the culture that is manifest as a result of, of the both explicit and implicit norms uh, of appropriate behavior that, that emerge. Uh, leadership was something that socio-technical systems really did not necessarily focus on because so much of the, the, the way in which it was practiced was around the notion of self-managed work teams. Um, and then all of this has to operate within the larger context of, of socio-ecological and organizations, single organizations really operate within a system of other organizations, competitors, suppliers, regulatory bodies, um, not for profits. I mean, it, and and without without understanding those dynamics, and it's becoming even more critical now because we, we start to look at the boundaryless organizations. We start looking at networks. We, we I mean, the the notion of business ecosystems has blown up in the last oh I don't know seven to ten years. 
10 years ago, you would never hear that phrase. I had a business partner who said, oh, that's just, that's cliche talk. Nobody's really interested in that. And now you can't turn around without people talking about their ecosystem strategy. Um, I've got clients that are wrestling with what's the ecosystem they want to operate within. So we need to understand the, the underlying dynamics and the, the environments uh, within which uh, organizations are operating, enterprises. And, and um, so purpose becomes critical. Uh, notions of system boundaries or, or of entity boundaries and, and the mutual beneficial or, or the notions of reciprocity and mutualism within those, those entities. And, and there are paradoxical elements to this, the, you know, the socio-technical systems. How do, you, how do you have both the opportunity for dynamism and innovation at the same time, you have a reasonable level of, of consistency in your ability to deliver and realize value. So you know, I'll move the slides myself now. Oh, Doug, but maybe just before you move that. Sure. Oh, okay. Um, I haven't moved yet. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that this is the original sort of definition of these three perspectives. And uh, what was important is that we realized people really don't see these three perspectives very well when they're inside a, a system. Um, they don't see how sometimes they're even misaligned, like if. Uh, they have group think and, and they're not really seeing uh, what's going on in the larger world. And Doug had pulled out a quote uh, from, uh, I think it was from, um, was it from Trist under your, your slide? I just want to read it. Yes, that with these three lenses and the first principles, what uh, Emery and Trist were suggesting that these become a, substitute symbolical field of coherence that allows us to cope with our emerging turbulent environment and allows every adult, not just professionals, the capability to make choices about organization design. And I know in my own experiences, helping people to understand how they work together and whether they can collaborate and or build a collaborative muscle, was very important, even more important than the final design that we came up with for the work system. And helping them understand these different perspectives, um, a lot of times people would say to me, you messed up my mind because they didn't think like that about social systems. And um, I worked with women in a factory who were, um, had the lowest level jobs in the factory and the men ran all the uh, machinery. And um, after a bit of time, they said, well, we could do that too. We know how to do that and we want to do that. And so they began to uh, become multi-skilled and start to work in teams. And then they came to me and they said, this isn't working. And when I asked why, they said, because our husbands don't like it when we ask them to make those kinds of decisions at home. So then you begin to realize how big the ecosystem is and who you have to include in it. So uh, the, the sense of coherence of understanding of what a social system is, is the sense making that we feel people need before they engage in design. Back to you, Jeff. No, thank you. You've just, you've summarized this next slide with the, with the three overlapping Venn diagrams and it's, it's, it's really about the foundation is these first principles for humanistic designing, as opposed to mechanistic or economistic designing or bureau, bureaucratic principles for design. Um, and so it leads to this sort of much more coherent picture and recognition of, of, of how this all needs to fit together. And I think Carolyn's example is, 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 is right on the mark and, and some of the work she's doing now or that she and I have both done with um, uh, farm workers and, 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 and how engaging them more fully and giving them voice around their work in the fields 
translates into a level of, of, of respect within their families and their community. And, 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 and so it, it, the, the implications are pretty dramatic for how we look at at designing our enterprises or, or designing collective activity. Um, and, and so it, it, it needs to be integral, it needs to really be system. And, and we feel strongly that it, that it has to be participative. And, and yes, and because Doug too, each of these perspectives has a, is a built in paradox of both stability and dynamism like the, the he's already mentioned about the, the work system having some stability, but also being a learning system, um, having a culture as a stable bridge of, of uh, strong ties, and at the same time being able to take in all kinds of new ideas. And the um, socio-ecological being at the same time a negotiated order of how we're going to be lived together, but at the same time, pursuing alternate futures. So these things, this is our new conceptualization of these uh, three lenses that they each contain a paradox of stability and uh, dynamism. And we have to help people find their own balance or equilibrium in those paradoxes because each system design will be different. And if we talk about it as participative design, one of, the, one of the interesting notions is this really comes down to something very basic and very human. Um, it, it's, it's about deliberations and, and dialogue. And as, as we've looked at, at um, various, I mean, and this is, this list of, of methods and approaches for um, organizational design really relies ultimately on, on uh, design of, or co-design of structured deliberations. Dialogic organization design, dialogic organization development, participative design workshops, co-design, co-creation, uh, the, the search conference methodology of uh, Marilyn and Fred Emery, future serp, uh, serp, uh, searches, uh, Jan, Jan Off and, and Marv Weisbord, conference model by the Axelrods, so sociocracy, liberating structured. Uh, we have colleagues that, that are looking at something called people powered innovation collective. Um, World Cafes, Design charia, uh, Charettes, Axelrods, Meeting Canoe Model, Agile is, is, is really structured deliberations, uh, Open Space Technology, Participatory Action Research, um, Relational Coordination, and we could add probably many, many more. It's just a partial list. So what's this notion of deliberations? And it's to, we see it as sort of a meta methodology because what we're, what one of our colleagues in a, a workshop that we did recently, Bernard Moore, who is out of that um, appreciative inquiry field, uh, sort of said, you know, this is interesting. So we don't really design the social system. We design or co-design the deliberations by which the people who live in that system co-design and co-create their own social system. And we went, yeah, exactly. And so what is the deliberation? And this, this for those of you who had a chance to look at the Pava paper that, that uh, Carolyn and I wrote about his work for uh, this huge compendium of change thinkers. Uh, and, 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 and Pava was one of Trist, according to Trist, his, his best doctoral student ever. And he, much of socio-technical systems practices, if not principles, were defined within traditional workplaces and traditional industries, process industries. And so there was typically fairly linear, consistent work, right? And, and so many of the, the tools and techniques 
were especially applicable. And, and Pava noted that more and more of the work that was being done was really now becoming knowledge work. And, and, and the product of knowledge work is advancing knowledge. And so, and it's also the, the notion of nonlinear work, which is not strictly, it doesn't occur in the same sequential fa fashion. And he, he identified as the primary unit of analysis, deliberations. And so his work was around how do we design nonlinear work systems? And, and Carolyn and I are, are kind of putting together this paper on change thinkers have started to extend it to, this is really at the heart of all social systems redesign, co-design co and, and, and uh, co-creation. And a deliberation is, is a pattern of exchange and communication. And, it, but it's also, it, it's, it's, there are reflective elements in it so that it's not strictly dialogue separate from people processing information and maybe on their own moving it forward, advancing knowledge. And ultimately it's to reduce the uncertainty and ambiguity of problematic issues, messes, problematics, um, Gordian knots, all of those sorts of things. And, and there are key elements to a deliberation that we think it, it's useful to understand that as, as social systems designers, once again, what we're really doing is co-designing with, with people from whatever the social system is that is under consideration. What are, the, what are the topics that need to be addressed? What's the design challenge? What's the problem to be solved? What's the inquiry topic if we use AI? Um, what are the critical topics? And who are the voices that need to be in the room, the room metaphorically, because it, it, as we know now, there are ways to do this, not only in person, which in, in, I still think is, is the preferred ultimate way, but also virtually, right? Who, who are the participants that need to make up these dynamic coalitions? Because it's non-linear, it's a non-linear process. An addition from Pava is what's the data that needs to be brought to bear? And something that's really critical is, is what are the forums that are most optimal? Structured, semi-structured, unstructured, ad hoc, in-person, informal interactions, internet collaboration platforms, whatever it might be. And so I'm, I mentioned this because once again, and I'll go back in, in the slides. All of these approaches to social system co-designing are really structured forms of deliberations and deliberation design. And we, this, this uh, particular uh, figure is, is in the, the article that Carolyn and I wrote about uh, Cal Pava's work. And, it, and it's an elaboration of, of some of his initial work to reflect that we're here in 2021 and not 1983, and just how dramatic the digital uh, context we operate within is. And at this point, I, I, I can go through any of this, but it, I'm happy also to, and Carolyn would be as well, to follow up with you afterwards if you want kind of a more detailed look at this, but it's, it's about ultimately, how do we advance knowledge such that uh, we have new perspectives, new insights, agreements, dis disagreements, decisions, commitments to actions, improved algorithms, and, and ultimately expanded pool of shared knowledge, shared understanding, and as a byproduct, a critical byproduct, increased trust and enhanced ability to collaborate moving forward so that the notion of, of deliberations is not only the process by which we 
co-design and co-create the social system, but we also use it as a, we, uh, as a means and a mechanism for continuously addressing, redesigning, developing, advancing, learning as we move forward. But it, it really does require our using these broader perspectives, the socio-psychological, the socio-technical, and the socio-ecological. And with that, we'll take a breath and, and um, true to your form, we you know, open this up to whatever people want to discuss. Great, thanks. So there's some, um, some dialogue going on in the chat right now. Right. Uh, Elena, would you like to uh, speak a little bit about some of the questions or comments you're making? Uh, yeah, I have had the experience recently with working a little bit with uh, Chris Stockis. Uh, Peter Jones is involved in this and Kevin Dye, who are working with this structured dialogic design which is a rigorous process uh, implemented by Kajoscope and other uh, software. And I wondered if that sort of technique or methodology was overlapping with what you're discussing. I, I only have limited knowledge of, of the dialogic organization design, but I, I, because we're claiming that that deliberation or uh, design or co-design of deliberations is really this meta methodology, I would think absolutely. Um, and I, I don't know what the implicit values or design principles are, the assumptions upon which they're based, but I would make the assumption that they are more humanistic than they are mechanistic and bureaucratic. I think that right? would be that would be correct. Yes. I think that uh, what made me think it was similar is we've been looking at collaborating with a disintegration and a structured dialogic design, mm -hmm. and the disintegration actually does not need quite as much in the way of hard data. Uh, a lot of it's about values and purposes and that sort of thing that are discussed uh, among of the different interacting teams, but it seemed that the socio-technical and the structured dialogic design really works very well when you've got quite a lot of actual facts at your disposal. So you can consider alternatives, you can get every, all the stakeholder viewpoints, uh, you can integrate them, you can look at what's driving what. Right. Um, it also has some overlap with Vester's, Vester, Frederick Vester's sensitivity analysis. That, that actually within, within the community, the STS community, we have wrestled with um, the role of, of experts and, and the, the and, and it's, it's, it's not an either or. Right, um, engaging expertise, but not not to do the design, but rather as a source of data, right? And coupled with the the lived experiences of the people who comprise the system, right? And then then we have colleagues who talk about in, including what they call free radicals into their process and. Uh, the the way that they structure their deliberations, so, and we, and we haven't looked at it in depth, but Peter, we because it's only just recent that uh, uh, we we came across your work. But yeah, you Peter, could you could, could, could you jump in? Yeah, well, likewise, uh, Doug, and uh, I'd say that. Uh, uh, one of my recent publications, The Context of Co-Creation, which is in, a, in the um, Springer uh, collection, was, um, was an attempt to organize a set of principles and approaches for, um, for being able to guide uh, general approaches to co-creation 
that would take into account uh, the Christakis and Warfield principles developed from the uh, um, uh, what, what's called the, uh, uh, the domain of science model, but to apply that, to take that out of really the science domain and into a domain of design model because the, right. the, uh, this, uh, uh, this was developed back in the 1980s, this idea of the domain of science, which is a way of, which is part of the, uh, of this deliberative process of tying it to, um, tying it to methodologies of, um, uh, that would allow us to do influence mapping using the interpretive structural modeling algorithm and to align that to very um, kind of humanistic dial dialogue engagement so that right. people, so the participants of dialogue shouldn't have to feel that they're part of a high, you know, part of a highly structured um, process that behind the scene is kind of tracking and setting up uh, an influence map of their, uh, you know, of, of, their, of their dialogue. There was a, a dialogue, this process of dialogue mapping that was popular about 10 years ago with Jeff, Con Jeff Conklin's method that was based on um, Horst Riddle's uh, IBIS, the issue-based information system. And they had the compendium software and it was meant to actually kind of structure the influence map of a deliberation in live uh, presentation. And so this is, this is kind of part of the original idea, I think, of, of um, even the Cognoscope or of the software that Warfield and Christakis were continuing to, to develop in the, from the 70s on, actually, was that you yeah. could have a facilitator presenting the results of the dialogue as it constructed, and that this would be visual feedback to the participants. But it yeah. turns out that that really reduces the the naturalistic participation of people in that type of dialogue right. that if you're getting direct feedback, it can then start to become a groupthink process. And I don't know if Conklin found that, but eventually the dialogue mapping process is, I, I just haven't seen it in the literature and I don't really know what's happened to that, but I noticed it wasn't on your slides either, but it was the compendium software had a lot of support from you know, from uh, from the UK, Benjamin Bucking or I mean, uh, uh, Buckingham Shum's uh, 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 um, kind of open source effort to develop the software for live mapping of dialogue, where what we learned in in dialogic design was to conduct the di you know the deliberative dialogue as naturalistically as possible, right. so that people would discover that they were themselves in a real, you know, well-structured, democratic, but live dialogue setting where they knew that all, the, all of their utterances were being recorded, but, they, but the structuring of, their, of, of the relationships of, of the dialogue and of their voting happened much later. And so they, they would see that as an outcome of the process. So these are, there are different ways of, stru of structuring things from very loose methods like you know, World Cafe and Open Space which right. are intentionally very open and, and, and often don't go anywhere in terms of their um, decision. You know, they, they don't have a strong capacity for decision-making. Right. The decision-making comes out of those deliberations is based on uh, the quality of intent that the participants themselves uh, have. But these structured processes can be used in highly contentious situations and in, in uh, political and, and uh, um, and um, you know foreign policy deliberations and such. We've got a colleague in, in uh, the roundtable and also in the organization design forum and the European organization design forum, uh, Stu Winby, who is something called a decision accelerator. And, and it's it's a highly structured set of deliberations. It, he claims it's it's very participative and representative typically because it actually includes physical space. And, 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 and people move back and forth between the hole and pods and things like that. What it relies on is an awful lot of support staff capturing the information and feeding it back to people as quickly as possible, but not necessarily recording it, right? 
And then he incorporates um, various elements of design thinking and other sorts of things because he's located there uh, in Silicon Valley and, and, and one of his colleagues in all of this is, is one of the original founders of IDEO. And so uh, there, there's, there, there are, and, and it's, it's not unlike what a number of large consulting firms did where they set up these, these sort of idea generation, physical environments and companies would troop in with 40 or 50 executives and go through a series of deliberations and, and have, the, have the data fed back to them really, I mean, in virtually real time so they could make some decisions on the way out. Um, future search and search conferences tend to lead to some level of commitment uh, to action. Not always, but, but they certainly create a, a, a momentum and an energy, energy towards, and here's what we're going to do about it, as long as the right voices are, are actually in the room. So, Carolyn? Well, you know, this is something we've been struggling with, Doug, is that, um, there is data that needs to come in that helps people reflect on what's going on um, in their, especially in their ecosystem that because there's so many different stakeholders with such different points of view and they see things, they see their world so differently. Um, often getting this new, more neutral data allows them to build a picture together that uh, they can then have some dialogue around. And so I think we're struggling with how do we bring this in and use it in ways that will help people have better and deeper understanding. Peter, can I uh, interrupt with a question? Uh, no, no, I'm okay. sorry, got few ahead of you. So I'm actually gonna okay. go to, um, I'm gonna go, uh, let's see. Sorry, I'll go to Seymour. Um, my background is organizational change. So I'm a, for all intents and purposes, a uh, quote, a seasoned practitioner from that perspective. And as far as socio systems are concerned, technical, ecological, psychological, they've been part and parcel of my methods and others over the past number of years. What I'm trying to understand is um, both Carolyn and Doug is what are you trying to how, what are you trying to do with SCS going forward? Hmm. Are you trying to uh, find out if the same language that you just presented still holds true? And, and ergo, we should continue to deepen the training and the teaching and. Or are you finding that there's more pushback just because of the drive of the technology pressures we're under and therefore we have a fundamental issue of changing the, the I'll call it the underpinnings of culture and thinking because no one's talked about critical thinking, for example, which is kind of important underneath all of this. So I'm just trying to understand before getting into a discussion about facilitation methods, et cetera, which are all very nice, but. I, I'm, I'm trying to understand how I can, how I can feed into your, and understand your question so I can feed into it in some fashion. Can you expand, please? Carol, you want to take a shot at that because that was something that that I know, uh, coming out of Los Angeles uh, roundtable meeting. Um, you and Bert especially uh, wrestled with. Well, I, Seymour, I don't think, I think we think, well, I should say most of our community thinks our language is what gets us in trouble of making STS relevant. Okay. So um, they want to really find a way to use the concepts to help people create uh, thriving lives and flourishing cultures and live in a better world. And how do we, is, you know, how do we still use what Emory and Trist gave us 
but maybe shape it differently, offer it differently, uh, combine it with others, offer it to others who can use it in some way to expand their own models and frameworks. So that makes sense to you? It, it makes sense. Sorry, I, I was when I when I look at what you're trying to do and think about org change, it's this is this is grist for our mill on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's now a question of uh, being very uh, aware of the cultures we're dealing with and therefore the language that we use in order to further our objectives, or in this case, the senior, the senior executive who hired us who's paying our bills objectives. That, I mean, that's, that's one element, but the other element I took from the humanistic piece, and I'm taking more um, broader, if you maybe philosophical approaches, how do you engage, how do we engage the world around us to become more humanistic so they'll see the value and be able to implement the value of what you're presenting? Because sometimes we, you're right, our language gets too complex, too complex and Right. People are afraid of it to stand back and say, oh, no, I can't, can't touch that. That's sort of bad for me. But uh, I think that it's like even using the word system thinking. Sometimes we don't, we shouldn't use it. We should just do it. And people will get it just by the doing rather than by the using of the word. Right. So uh, that's what I was trying to, trying to understand because a lot of the discussions have been applied uh, from a systems point of view. And and we can so certainly go back to what Tris has done or go back to uh, what other, other good, good thinkers, thank goodness for us, uh, years ago. But I, I really would like, it'd be interesting to find a, a, a way of taking STS and finding that new language. And one of the, one of the comments, which I thought was uh, the term dialogic, which also reminded me of conversation, is that well, that's really what we're trying to do. And I spend most of my time not worrying about improving business process to drive new performance, but how do I um, facilitate a conversation between individuals um, and, and teach new managers who are highly structured to learn how to facilitate that conversation uh, because there's no trust and of course, most organizations have no trust and it's, it's all this mechanistic thinking that's like, oh God, I can't do this. But, we need to, you know, my view is we need to teach and enable these new managers to learn and the people who become new managers to learn how do I facilitate this conversation so that uh, we can enable these individuals together to say, ah, we as a group have come up with this new idea, however they did it. Uh, kudos to the people who study facilitation. So I, it just seems to me that there's, there's all of this wonderful insight that's already out there, and yeah. and I'm saying, and and I, I look, I'm only one little pinhead in in the global world, but I've been there, done that. Um, so I'm now saying, let's let's take what we've learned organizationally, and certainly systemically, and I'm talking from the systems point of view, and certainly, and and I know that uh, Peter mentioned Maturana in the chat, and certainly what Maturana and Varela have taught us, and see if we can present it in a new way, but still pragmatically recognize that we have some technical issues, we have some humanistic issues, we have some philosophic issues, and those are the things we need to understand and we shouldn't shy away from that. Your, your comment um, uh, suggests two, two key things to me. You mentioned languaging, one of the best examples that I've seen um, of late is Gary Hamill and, and Michele Zanini's book, Humanocracy. And they do a wonderful job. I, I, and, and I shared it with colleagues in, in the STS roundtable and some of the current concerns pushed back were digital is so powerful and perverse, pervasive. We need to really just like all hands on deck to address the the potential nefarious implications of digital. Um, but their language, languaging of these issues and of the fundamental shift that's, that hopefully is occurring, and I, I hope we're at a tipping point where we either, either go more towards the autocratic oligarchs world, right? Command, control, predict and control, that world, or, we, we go to 
true democracy, true participation, right? And more of a, what I would consider a humane world within which we have fairly humane or very humane institutions and communities. And, and, and Hamill and Zanini have done a good job of languaging it in a way that is accessible to the world of business at least, right? And, and they, they've done a nice job of just describing all of the costs associated with the implicit design principles of, of bureaucracy and scientific management and Taylorism and all of these other things that we've suffered with for so long. And, and that's just one example. The other thing that I keep being reminded of is, is that, you know, your clients in the business world talk about how siloed their organizations are. It seems to be a standard refrain. I do not think there is a, an institution out there that is more siloed than academia, right? Because so, I, you know, my, most of my stuff has been kind of uh, between business and as Carolyn said, looking at the ecological and, and, and writing about issues management alliances and all of the things that, that required a different set of logics and, and principles than traditional notions where there were tight, rigid boundaries between sectors and all of those sorts of things. And, but then, you know, see the work that Peter is doing and the work that is just done across all of these different disciplines, right? So, so I, I just, I'm constantly reminded of as I look at the chat. I, I'm gonna stop, that's an excellent summary we should, you should write down those words. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to move on. Uh, Christina, Christina, and Nishat, and then um, I see Zad's going to explode in a little while, but we'll get to Christina first. <laughs> I, I don't know that my question's as well formulated as, as others, so I don't think we need to spend much time online, but it just occurred to me that groupthink keeps being mentioned um, across, you know, the different comments and discussions that are being had. And I just wonder if the first principles that were shared, which unfortunately I, I don't, I, we only saw them for a limited time, so I, ha I don't have them memorized, <laughs> but I was wondering how, when you were crafting those, how you were thinking about actually troubleshooting for the dangers of group think when, um, when that's so um, uh, often one of the biggest challenges in, in some of these types of exercises and methods. Carolyn, the reason I'm not saying anything is because I'm waiting for you. No, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> um. Um, you know, th thank you for raising that question because like anything else, it, it is important and, and this is something we still need, need to do. And as I said, this is kind of like still in draft form. Um, and and it, it's, I mean, Peter described a set of principles that, that he has identified and Emery and, or Emery, well, Trist to some degree too, the ideals and things and, um, but, but an important point is exactly what you're raising is, is, is how to look at the unintended consequences. Um, one, one of the hopes is, is that, and this is where it starts to get into some of, of um, Arjus's work on single, double, and, and even potentially triple loop learning that, that, that the, the work itself or the, the living in the social system is kind of single loop and, and, and you do that and, and more and more of that, that work and that interchange is done through deliberations, real time shop floor, real time water cooler, real time on a collaboration platform. I got to take that back. Machines don't collaborate, 
people collaborate, but that's just a personal bias and I'm tired. Because if you, if you look up collaboration platforms, Google it, you'll see, I don't know how many millions of hits and they're all for software platforms. Yeah. And I kind of go, no, no, organizations are collaboration platforms for people, right? Anyhow, I'm sorry, just a little sidebar that drives me crazy. <laughs> but it, it, the, the unintended consequences are, are, are a critical piece. The double loop learning is being able to, to have the people participating step back and say, what's working, what's not working, right? And, and this is one of the things that Agile as a methodology has, because they, they, they structure retrospectives after every sprint, every week, every two weeks, every month, whatever, whatever the, 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 the appropriate uh, time horizon is. Um, and then triple loop is, is almost the, what is the, you know, sort of the ground of being, the transformational piece of it. And that doesn't occur as frequently, but one of the things Carolyn can speak to is the application of this notion of deliberations, both within the, the plant at um, uh, the GE Aviation Plant south of Montreal. Um, examples that, that Hamill and Zanini use are of this, this uh, Dutch home healthcare organization called Burtzorg. And they've, they've got, I don't know, what is it, 14, 15,000 employees and a corporate staff of, of under 100, most of whom are in IT collecting data to share. And two people are responsible for um, 14,000 people, basically. And, and what they do, though, is they teach all of these squads of 12 people how to deal with conflict, how to hold meetings, how to work together, how to interpret the data, basically how to hold really good deliberations about how they want to deliver healthcare to the geography that they're responsible for. And it's been an incredible success story. Um, Bromont, I know, it, it, what they do is they've got this participative management approach whereby if the people out on the floor see something, they take it to whatever, whatever joint committee there is, you know, so have a couple of engineers and then we'll have a number of people who are doing the real work of this aviation plant and they will wrestle with, okay, how do we improve that process? How do we make it safer? How do we bring robotics on board? How do we, whatever it might be. And my guess is, Carolyn, there was a lot of effort putting into educating the people who made up that organization of that Greenfield site originally around how to hold good meetings, conversations, conflict, all of those sorts of things. Yes, and creating a level playing field for all, everyone to engage by, for example, having all the managers spend a, a day a week on the shop floor doing some of the work that workers do um, so that everybody understood the plant in the same way. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the question. That was a very good question. I'm going to insert a little bit. I dropped a few links in there um, because the question that Christine had asked was about um, about groupthink, and part of that could be covered by the design of inquiring systems that Wes Churchman had been had done. In Ian Mitroff is actually the inheritor of that, and he's been publishing recently. I also left a drop for people that want a free read. Uh, TechLash is open ac access. And um, it's actually it's positioned as an art as an, as a a book about Google uh, and Facebook and how that they aren't actually um, handling their morals properly. But it's interesting that uh, when you appreciate that uh, Ian Mitroff moved from inquiring systems into crisis management, that in effect uh, he's kind of telling Facebook and Google, you guys have a crisis coming. And you guys should do something about it now, as opposed to waiting for it later. Uh, so those links are in the uh, in the chat. If you want to follow through, uh, Nishat, you had a question next. Yeah, well, you don't need to spend much time on my question. Um, it'll it'll be a, it'll be a really 
simple question. I know that Peter Jones uh, dropped a note in the chat saying that there is a lot of, uh, currently, there is a lot of uh, concern about uh, systems control, um, but not so much concern about, say, um, things like negotiated order or dialogic processes, et cetera. Is that something that you see is, as a real problem in the current world? Uh, do you think that there is not enough dialogue, not enough uh, you know, uh, people standing around the water cooler and holding a real conversation and honest, open, direct channels of conversation? Uh, do you see that as a real concern, even though we have the technology for that in the current um, decade? Can't see your face, Carolyn. So I, 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 I no, you go, I go ahead. I, I don't like the word control because of connotations. It is something, though, that that in interacting and working with our our uh, colleagues from the what they call the the Benelux, the Lowlands countries, they they talk about control systems, and I. I I understand it, it, it's it's need, but perhaps I have an aversion because I, when I was you know in grad school at York, and especially even before that at Waterloo, the the purpose of psychology was to predict and control, and I always thought, no, 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 it's to understand and liberate and 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 be sensitive to and all those sorts of things uh human nature um i prefer coordination systems it's, it's how do we coordinate collective activity right and and I, I would assume that there there is within that what are the appropriate uh expectations boundaries non-negotiables uh or negotiables and 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 the the, the sort of uh appropriate ways to show up um now and now when, when we talk about high reliability systems and i i forget who raised that and i don't know if she had to sign sign off uh if she did it's unfortunate because we have a colleague in the socio-technical system space eli berniker who's written some inter has some interesting work on high reliability systems and the application of socio-tech systems and he's on the West Coast in, in the Tacoma area. Um, so I, 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 you know, the notion of control systems, I have trouble because of, of what it implies. It's usually unilateral control, right? It's the very much the top-down control. And uh, I think there's more to be gained from really looking at it in terms of the coordination mechanisms and that are appropriate for whatever the context might be. Carolyn, bail me out, okay? <laughs> well, I don't know, Nishad, if what I wasn't sure I completely understood the question, but I wanted to relate it back to our three lenses because. In my experience of doing design is that people live pretty much at the level when Doug was describing um, the three levels of, uh, I'm sorry, Doug, I must be tired, the three levels of uh, arduous levels of- Single, double, triple loop learning. Yes, so that most people don't pay attention to more than the single, the single loop learning. And so when you're trying to dig deeper and understand, um, you know, what is actually going on here in our social system? What is it that we're doing with each other in our interactions? What are the patterns that are going on? Because those patterns that are in this room, in this moment, as we're designing are going to be translated into the design. So we need to understand them and understand our tensions around them because maybe one of you sees the world this way, the other sees it another way. And we have to understand why we see it differently so we can get to a design that is mutually beneficial for everybody. And um, I think that's where um, 
what we're trying to use our three lenses for is to help people understand how their own behaviors in their at the micro, because the systems do socio-psychological is pretty much at the micro level, the socio-tech at the meso level and the socio-ecological at the macro level. So we're trying to help people understand those three things and how they interface at the same time, um, because it's very complex and hard to see. And we think that this is somewhat like a kaleidoscope. They, they turn the lens and they see a different view of the same reality. And then they turn it again and see a different view again, the institutional view that is uh, putting constraints or affordances around the reality. So that's um, how, and we don't think people have those dialogues. They don't have that kind of reflection and deliberation uh, because of time, because the tension it produces. This is a Seymour was talking about facilitation. This is very difficult to facilitate. Uh, it is not easy. And um, it, I know it took me a long time to learn how to do this well. And um, it's still difficult no matter what environment you go in because each has its own unique um, way of operating. And now that I'm working in, the, in agriculture on a project to transform agriculture, uh, before it gets hit with this tremendous wave of uh, precision ag agriculture and all this automation that basically removes the autonomy from the growers and the field workers and removes field workers themselves. I mean, it's, it's people haven't talked about this and so trying to even create these dialogues in that world is very, very difficult. Oh, thank you for one adding that, but thank you also, uh, David, for posting uh, Eli Berniker's uh, name there. Um, Zad, you have some questions? You may have multiple, actually, I think. <laughs> well, no, I'll try to. Uh, so I had a few minutes to think about my question. I still haven't been able to formulate it uh, the best way in my mind. So I'm going to stumble through the question. And the preface is that this might, this question might be outside of the content that you shared today. So it might not be exactly in the domain. Um, and I got to this question in two ways. One is that I've, I worked with Peter Jones's uh, principles of systemic design in my thesis. And I've been kind of uh, using that quite a bit and also working with David Ng on our systems changes learning. And one of the things that both streams of the activities that I work on between the two as coming towards is really questioning like, I guess you could say the epistemological foundations of how uh, you kind of understand what you know and how to even reason through that. And I wonder if the socio, macro, meso, micro kind of levels, does this approach presume that human agency has uh, intervention like ability, like a human agency is able to actually intervene in a way and if so, um, uh, sorry, I lost my question. Uh, does, does it presume human agency and, and are there larger forces at play where, which are not human? And therefore, if you take this to the end result, perhaps in the both of your practices, have you ever ran into a situation where you're like, well, the best thing to do is actually to, not, to do nothing. Like let this, like you might, you might come to a conclusion that's like, let this organization flounder let this thing pass the way it is. And this brings into a lot of other orientations, especially Eastern philosophies around the nature of change. And so I wonder the socio-technical or socio-ecological, socio-psychological systems presume human agency and therefore maybe are limiting themselves to where non-intervention can be valuable. That, that, that question has so many potential layer. <laughs> uh, the notion of human agency is, is both something to be desired and potentially incredibly destructive for the planet, right? And, and it's just something that I've been powerfully, it's sort of been in my face since a uh, dialogue with a colleague last week about how 
Western ways of thinking and logics and the assumption about the role of, of human beings in the natural order is somehow appropriate, right? Um, and and that, that it is our role to dominate nature. Well, but that's a whole different and much larger uh, issue uh, than, than I think what you're asking. And, and, and will some organizations just simply evolve out of existence? Yeah, they do. Uh, they usually end up being, um, their name ends up on the left-hand side of the hyphen. And by that, it means they're in a secondary position, and all that sort of stuff. And so they disappear accordingly. Um, and, and, and at the same time, they will have typically spent tens of millions of dollars on different interventions to prevent that. But for whatever, and, and, and the, the, the reasons for why uh, so many companies come and go are myriad. So I'm not sure that I answered that question, but it's like it triggered this other thing that I'm wrestling with too about what is our, our position in this reality that we live that is beyond just, you know, our assumption that, that we are the predominant species, right? And how that's impacted the much larger systems within which we operate. Yeah. So, so Zan, did you mean to uh, also, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you essentially asking what is the role of the natural uh, in yeah. socio-ecological system that's a that's um, context that is yeah does the how can we actually design with the ecology absolutely as a, as a stakeholder in in our right. in our in our systems in social right. systems and to right. push that even further you might have to reduce your own human role which is like sounds backwards it's like you're designing for your role to be less so that some other natural force is the dominant designer in a way, <laughs> like it's kind of sounds funky to yes. describe that way, but yeah. Well, well see even Akoff touched on this when he identified kind of the four orders of, of systems, the mechanistic, uh, you know, an organismic, the social, and, and essentially the ecological is one where the parts have choice, but the whole does not. And so this sense of, of, of letting the ecology just evolve without having to define it. If an organization is really going to be seen as an, as an ecology and as a business ecosystem, for example, which I think is a real misnomer, um, yeah. if it really is an ecosystem, then we aren't in a place to design its outcomes, but as, indiv as individuals and as organisms, that is as social systems within that ecology, we we have choice in our, our own evolutions and the ways that they interact, right. but there's no overseeing control over that ecology. Yeah, that's a great balance between it, your your notion of control and right. where this natural element was going. And that's interesting that you mentioned that because we've had that 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 kind of deliberation slash debate as well. People talk about designing ecosystems, and I kind of go, you you may be able to design. Uh, some the interactions of some network players within the ecosystem, but the ecosystem exists. So, and yeah, yeah it, but we go it, people go back and forth because they want to come up. They you know it's it's very popular to talk about business ecosystems now. So, is Anthony still on the call? Getting upward. This is yeah. This is a debate that we have in the Flourishing Enterprise Institute, and it's kind of a, a matter of our uh, one of our points is that yeah, if we're including the ecology you know, into our deliberations, what's the scope, the level of that? You know, what's the re actual region of that ecology? Very often we globalize it to be the climate or the environment, and we go we don't actually deal with any particular ecosystem. You know, with, with you know, with with the intent of design, with positive intent, we we treat it as an abstraction, and we want to treat it as a real material, you know, socio-material 
um, context. And so when we talk about business ecosystems, we always want to return people to really thinking about the ecology within the business ecosystem. If we're going to talk about business ecosystems. We need to include the ecosystem in that conversation in some ways. To me, that's an opening for that. And that's very humanistic. I mean, it isn't human centered, but it's strongly humanistic to bring in those that can't speak for themselves. I think we're uh, gradually winding down. If anyone has any final questions or thoughts, um, time to speak up. Uh, would, David, would you mind if I just raised a point here? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to thank the first off, uh, you know, Douglas and Carolyn for their uh, wonderful feedback. I, I was listening to Zad's comment about uh, sort of being, uh, how should I say it? Not a human agent, not, not being an agent, not being an actor. And it struck me is that, you know, there's a couple of different scenarios here, I think, that I wondered if people could think about. Um, one of them was that, okay, first off, we, we're making the assumption how somehow we can control the universe, that we are in fact the center of the universe, which of course is not true. I think that that's, a, that's the first point I would. Second, the other thing is that, you know, I, I, I do believe that there are situations where the, the universe, the ecosystem will just do whatever it does because that's what it does. On the other hand, I, I would hope that we would co-live with it, so to speak, with, that we would be co-agents in it, if that's the right way to say it, that somehow we would do things in unison with it to recognize the beauty of the universe, to be a part of it, but not to try to overcome it. I don't know if that makes any sense or if that's possible, but I sure would like that to happen, that we coexist with it, that, that somehow we do that. I, I don't know, what, what do the learners audience today tell me about that? How would you, how would you suggest that to me? Or what, what have I missed? I, I, I don't think you've missed anything other than the fact that we're bumping up against uh, very deep-seated Western paradigms, as opposed to say First Nations, ways of uh, viewing, living, and being in the world. Um, I, I was struck by, I forget the guy's name. He's a commentator on either MSNBC or CNN who recently said that, you know, that, that, that America is, it, it, there was blank slate. There was really no culture here in North America, in the U.S. especially, because of U.S. sense of exceptionalism. You hopefully can hear the disdain in my voice for that. Um, and, and that, you know, yeah, the, the First Nations were here, but they really didn't have any culture. And I, that's triggered some, you know, sort of bringing me back to this issue of natural order and the true ecosystem within which we exist. And how do we live? Not as thinking that we were first in this world, but rather we were the latest and therefore need to be here to learn the wisdom of all those that came before us, all the other species, right? And starting to see some things now about how trees and forests communicate and have communities and starting to recognize that how we see and know the world, at least within Western epistemology, has really serious limits and implications for the planet. So other than just sort of, you know, being very recently reawoken to that, I'm a neophyte. Carolyn? No, I don't have anything to Oh, add. yeah, it was Rick Santorum. Thank you. I think we'll wrap up. But, uh, but on that note, um, uh, Doug and Carolyn, one of the things that the System Changes Learning Circle has been doing uh, as a test is we've been actually thinking about, uh, about how you design when you think about beavers. Because beavers build houses, they build uh, their lodges, and we consider them part of nature. 
And so one of the interesting tests we're actually doing as we, we test some of our theories is like, okay, if we were to talk about this, does it make sense in, uh, if we're talking about beavers as opposed to human beings? <laughs> um, part, part of that's related to uh, actually Acoff's categorization because he talks about animate beings. And so you have to be able to move. A tree doesn't move, but uh, beavers do move and they have a choice in doing that. So, right. Beaver so, logic. I like it. <laughs> beaver logic. I like that when they use that. <laughs> so, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, we're going to wrap up. Uh, for the next few months, I'll be turning it over to Peter. I'll still be doing some paperwork on it, but Peter will be uh, shepherding us through the uh, presentations from the SFI classes. Um, so um, we'll have some more information on that coming up, but I think we may be actually, actually be extending the time. We may shift the time a little bit because uh, Peter said they're outstanding presentations this time, so we may need to give them a little more time actually get through the material. We may start a little bit earlier and finish a little bit later. If people are on the screen, hopefully they can uh, find ways around that and, uh, and manage. Yeah, so, by that I think, you know, you've worked with me for a number of years, David, and you, you've seen so many of these uh, synthesis map presentations. They're always good. I mean, in the previous years and we're using the wall display, the wall touch screen display was pretty dramatic. But I think uh, this year's uh, teams are really, excited to present and we had um, several that came right out of, directly out of research projects so that they were mapping the results of, of their research, which is you know of uh, typical with the part-time cohort. And so I'm excited to see you know their you know to give them the opportunity for, for those to give those presentations to potential stakeholders and to our recently enlarged group when we, presented live in the seventh floor of, you know, the OCAD grad, grad building could only fit 25 or maybe 30 people in that room, um, you know, with the wall display, but we can get, you know, dozens or a hundred, you know, uh, here to listen. So I uh, look forward to, to getting the word out to, to hear these special presentations in June and July and maybe August as well. Let's see who Great. signs up. And Doug and Carolyn, Thanks. if you want to keep up with us, you know where to find us now, so you can join us too. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I am, I am, you know, it was wonderful to be able to um, virtually uh, come back to Canada for a while. I'm missing it in a big way. So this has been a wonderful kind of rejuvenation of that. And I am so looking forward to when the border opens so that I can visit and, and uh, meet some of you in person. So Great. this has been very enjoyable. Thanks again for having us. Right. Thanks. Bye. Thank everyone. you for joining us. Yeah. Good night, all. Yeah, Good night. Good night. Now, Peter, uh, not Peter, uh, well, David, mm -hmm. um, Bert Painter has published uh, a Modern Times production or something like that, if you look it up. Uh, oh, it's, oh, he's the one behind that. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that's that's and and we should have probably invited him too. He's a filmmaker as well as a, a social scientist slash consultant. Ah, uh, okay. And um, yeah, he he posted all of the the three volumes and all sorts of other really interesting things from the Tavistock tradition. So yeah, yeah, no, we we know those ones regularly. I didn't know Bert was the one behind it. Uh, well, you might <laughs> well, want to know. Yeah, no, you might want to uh, invite him sometime in the future, too. He's certainly an interesting guy, and he can tell you more. He's involved with that, the, the sort of global consortia, and ah. the smart organization design, and so works with the European, Nordic, and, and Australian colleagues. Okay. Great. So, well, one of the things we're doing here is, uh, I don't know if you can tell, but we're, you know, David and, and I and, and some and, and Elena and some others, but we're uh, conserving the uh, legacies to the extent possible. And David, I know David spends a lot of time doing this and I, and I do too, but I, there are certain ones that he pays attention to and that I pay attention to and that we, you know, and that we're using Systems Thinking Ontario and I, and I also do this in my teaching right. to, to try to bring, it isn't a matter of, it's almost, it, it isn't a matter of bringing, you know, edge voices to the center, but of, of 
of, of, of making sure that that highly developed, um, you know, high, you know, valuable, well-developed legacy um, systems, uh, theories and models and practices have a chance to survive through the century. And that to, to kind of bringing them back into discourse, one of the reasons I'm syncretic and as a designer, as a design, taking a design approach is to bring in, you know, is to use principles as a framework to right. integrate different systems theories so that can actually, for one thing, have a, the, the richness of that variety to Im, improve the, the potential for different choices that we might have and, and the availability of different methods, but also to deliver.